Baby Yoda live and in the flesh, a hundred year birthday party bringing a ton of new stuff, and a secret theme park walkway? We've got a whole lot to tell you about today to get you prepped and ready for your big Disneyland trip here on DFV Guide. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Blog. We can't make a 2023 Ultimate Guides playlist without including our West Coast favorite, so today's Ultimate Guide is all about the Disneyland side of things. We'll be covering both Disneyland and Disney California Adventure in one jam-packed video, and that means we got a lot of ground to cover, so settle in, get your blanket, get your popcorn, it is time. If you want your very own PDF of all the Disneyland things we're talking about today, make sure to tell us your email over at disneyfoodblog.com slash Disneyland 2023. That way we can send you this entire list and get you signed up for our DFB newsletter, which will keep you up to date about any more announcements and discounts we hear coming through the grapevine during the rest of the year. Time to dive headfirst into the Anaheim scene. What's new in Disneyland? Well, Disneyland wasn't outrageous when it came to introducing new experiences in 2022 because a lot of the new stuff is happening in 2023. But there are a few shiny new things you're going to want to know about that are available right now. First off, Mando and Grogu started roaming the grounds of Batu in Disneyland's Galaxy's Edge on November 18th. So now you can meet the dynamic duo out in the wild about every 30 minutes. The Hulk also came to take pictures with guests over in Avengers Campus toward the end of September, but only for a brief period of time. You see, this Hulk is the real deal here, and he's made with the Project Exo technology, which is being tested by Disney Imagineers to bring some massive characters into reality as their full-scale selves. I'm sure some gamma radiation was also used. The Hulk wouldn't be the Hulk without that, after all. Though we haven't seen the Hulk since that brief meet and greet period, he may pop back up in the parks again in the future when he's ready. Speaking of Avengers Campus, this area of Disney California Adventure is still at the moment the newest section of the Disneyland parks. It opened back in the summer of 2021 and brought with it a new ride, Web Slingers, the Spider-Man Adventure, new quick places to eat like Pim's Test Kitchen, and several new ways to meet your favorite MCU heroes. Disney Genie Plus got hit with a price increase back in October. Now, instead of this premium line bypassing service costing a flat rate of $25 per person per day, prices now start at $25, but are subject to change varying by date. Disneyland's Magic Key Annual Pass program has trudged some rather rocky terrain this past couple of years, but they went back on sale on November 16th. Just two days later, though, all Magic Key sales were put on pause again to help protect the experience of the Magic Key holders and the value those passes provide. So basically, they sold out in two days. Currently, Magic Key holders are only able to renew their already existing passes, but all new sales have been suspended until further notice. Again, if you are a Magic Key holder, you'll want to check out the reimagined Magic Key Terrace located in Pacific Wharf at Disney California Adventure Park. Magic Key Terrace is transformed into a hacienda hideaway with new furniture, lighting, drapery, stained glass windows, tile work, and murals. The new theme is centered around a backstory about a beautiful hacienda recently purchased by a young couple who wants to keep the charm of the old place while adding some comfortable contemporary touches. Magic Key holders can find wait times and join the Mobile Dine walk-up waitlist for the Magic Key Terrace on the Disneyland app. As Splash Mountain over in Disneyland's Critter Country is getting ready to close for good, we're excited to learn more about the ride that'll be replacing it as well, Tiana's Bayou Adventure, and that's set to open in Disneyland and Magic Kingdom late in 2024. But while we're waiting for more movement to happen with this giant retheme, we do have a new Tiana-themed shop to explore in the meantime called Eudora's Chic Boutique. The store is named after Tiana's mother, Eudora. You've got lots of Tiana and New Orleans and Princess and the Frog merchandise in there. It's supposed to eventually sell a line of merchandise featuring Tiana's very own spices and sauces that are grown up on the mountain as well as a bunch of other little bayou knickknacks you can pick up. The boutique will have a neighboring restaurant, we've been told, Tiana's Palace, which is set to open sometime in 2024 as well, but Disney hasn't officially announced it yet. We did get this word from Imagineers. We do think it's actually got the green light to go ahead, but they haven't announced it yet, which means maybe some things are still gummed up. And finally, Disneyland got to accessorize with Magic Band Plus Tech when it was introduced to the West Coast on October 26th. 2022. Now Disneyland guests can hold their park tickets, Lightning Lane reservations, hotel room keys, and photo pass pictures all in one convenient little bracelet. The Magic Band Plus also comes with new features that light up and vibrate at different interactive points around the parks. 
So that's what's new, what's coming soon. Though 2022 was pretty tame when it came to new releases in Disneyland, 2023 is not going to hold back for the Disneyland parks this year. Mickey's Toontown closed on March 9th, 2022 to begin the land's big transformation, which will make its debut on March 8th, 2023. And the land's new headliner attraction is, drumroll please, the trackless dark ride Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, which will open even earlier on January 27th, 2023. It is just too excited and it can't wait till spring. Runaway Railway, which is the first ride through attraction starring Mickey Mouse himself, will have its own unique building and queue in Disneyland since the ride will be housed in El Capitoon with lots of interactive elements on the inside to keep guests entertained during inevitably long wait times. Beyond the addition of Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, the reimagining of Mickey's Toontown will deliver even more new and interactive experiences to the classic area so families and young kids can have more opportunities to play together inside Disneyland Park. These will include experiences for both active and tactile play, giving kids the chance to slide and spin and splash and touch and listen. The Fountain in Centennial Park and the tribute Dreaming Tree, inspired by the one Walt Disney often sat underneath while growing up back in Marceline, Missouri, will give kids the chance to explore the land in a whole new way. Other spaces being reimagined include Mickey and Minnie's houses and Chippendale's Gadget Coaster. Goofy's house will become Goofy's How to Play yard, featuring a candy kitchen, while Donald's Duck Pond will feature a brand new splash area. New quick service dining will also be introduced to this area. Cafe Daisy will be a sidewalk table eatery serving up diner classics, and Good Boy Grocers will be a farmer's market roadside stand with several grab-and-go items. The 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company, which was founded on October 16, 1923, will be celebrated across the globe as Disney prepares for their 100 Years of Wonder celebration, one that will officially kick off on the 27th. The heart of the celebration will take place in California's Disneyland Resort, bringing with it two brand new nighttime time spectaculars. In Disneyland Park, Wondrous Journeys will make its debut on Sleeping Beauty Castle. This is a new fireworks and projection show that's going to give a round of applause to all 60 Walt Disney Animation Studios films so far. And an updated version of the World of Color Spectacular, called World of Color 1, easy enough to remember, will honor the storytelling legacy of Disney's first 100 years at DCA. The Magic Happens Parade will also be returning during the celebration after its extended hiatus due to the historic 2020 closures. This parade showcases several popular Disney stories like Moana, Coco, Frozen 2, and many others that have given us the warm fuzzies when we watch them time and time again. And this is truly an incredible parade. The music is bomb. It is great. The parade is slated to open on February 24th. Along with all the new and returning show openings, the park is going to be decked out in lots of platinum in honor of the 100th anniversary. Sleeping Beauty Castle will be getting a makeover with platinum banners and bunting and cabochon featuring the three good fairies who illuminate it with their pixie dust. There are also going to be two added fountains on either side of the castle because everything's better with more jets of water. Now, we're going to talk more about Disneyland After Dark events soon, but let me tell you about the newest event coming to Disneyland, Princess Night. For the first time ever, guests can experience Disneyland After Dark Princess Night, a brand new event with shimmering decor and photo ops and themed food and drinks and commemorative merch. Oh, and of course, princesses. Guests will be greeted in the park by Princess Minnie Mouse and Princess Daisy Duck and be treated to a concert featuring Moana and Merida. You can sway along to jazz music in New Orleans Square with Tiana and even have a candy-themed dance party with Vanellope von Schweetz in Tomorrowland. Princess Night will take place on March 7th and 9th at Disneyland Park, and tickets are on sale now. This is a very limited event with limited capacity, so if you want to experience it, grab your tickets ASAP. Tickets for the 7th are $129 per adult. Tickets for March 9th are $145. You will not need to worry about making a Park Pass reservation to go to a Disneyland After Dark event, but you will still need to make Park Pass reservations for any and all standard park visits. Let's talk Tarzan's Treehouse. It's currently closed in Disneyland for a major retheming, and Disney has revealed that the attraction will pay tribute to the original treehouse Walt Disney and his Imagineers built in 1962 for the movie Swiss Family Robinson. So that's returning in a fresh new way at Disneyland Park in 2023. And for some hotel news, Disneyland Hotel is currently getting that brand new Disney Vacation Club Tower. It's called the Villas at Disneyland Hotel. I know, so inventive and innovative. It'll be 12 stories tall, 
all and hold 350 DVC villas, plus a new pool, outdoor bar, interactive play area, community hall, and fitness center. The rooms will be inspired by Sleeping Beauty using colors and concepts from the animated film to create a subtle theme. You can expect the villas at Disneyland Hotel to open sometime in 2023. They are definitely hard at work over there right now. And now for some not-so-fun announcements. Ride closures. I mentioned that Splash Mountain's getting ready to close for good soon to make way for Tiana's Bayou Adventure, but a ton of other rides will be closing briefly for refurbishments starting January 9th. According to the Disneyland calendar, Indiana Jones Adventure is closing. As of now, an official reopening date is not listed, but it does indicate that the attraction will return sometime in spring 2023. Along with Indiana Jones, Grizzly River Run in DCA will close. The Disney Gallery and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln will also close on January 9th. Grizzly River Run is also slated to reopen in the spring, but there are no reopening timelines listed for the other two experiences. Starting January 9th, It's a Small World Holiday will also be closing for refurbishment. It'll then reopen as the traditional It's a Small World ride again, but there's no reopening date announced for it yet either. And a little later on in the month, Radiator Springs Racers will be closing in Disney California Adventure on the 17th for refurbishments. The ride doesn't have a reopening date either. One more and then I promise I'm done breaking your heart. Haunted Mansion will close temporarily starting January 30th to switch back over from Haunted Mansion Holiday and into its OG spooky format. Now, we also don't have an official closing date for Splash Mountain over there in Disneyland. Disney World's official closing date is January 23rd, so I'm not sure if they're going to give us an announcement pretty soon about Disneyland or not, but in the meantime, since both of those rides are on track to open in 2024, I would say it would probably be soon over there in Disneyland, so go ride it while you can. Lots of new Disneyland additions are still up in the air. We know they're coming, we just don't know when. Pixar Place, for instance, the current Paradise Pier Hotel will be revamped into Pixar Place Hotel, and this will be a spot where you're going to feel like you've stepped into a Pixar art gallery. There will also be a new flagship restaurant built on the first floor of the resort and a new Finding Nemo splash pad outside. We're not sure when all these changes will officially happen, but we do know that as they do start to happen, hotel amenities, including the direct entrance for hotel guests into California Adventure Park, will continue to remain open. The Downtown Disney Shopping District is also going to have some big changes going on, including innovative shopping, dining, and entertainment updates. A couple of these include bringing in new restaurants like the world-renowned family-owned Din Tai Fung, famous for its soup dumplings that are handcrafted right on site, and one of Southern California's favorite bakeries, Porto's Bakery and Cafe, known for its fresh baked breads, empanadas, breakfast pastries, and a lot more. That's coming to Downtown Disney too. We know that Hey Disney Tech has already started to be tested over in some of the Disney World hotel rooms, but these voice assistants should start popping up in Disneyland hotel rooms soon too. Hey Disney devices will be able to assist guests with room amenities, guest services, planning tips, weather information, and much more. It's basically an A-L-E-X-A for your hotel room, and it's gonna be in all Disney hotel rooms in Disneyland and Disney World. And way off in the future for 2024 and beyond, of course we've got Tiana's Bayou Adventure, but we are also listening for more info on other new experiences that were discussed during the parks panel at the D23 convention, like the reimagined Pacific Wharf area, which will be transformed into the Big Hero 6 themed San Francisco, and the new Avengers Dark Ride that'll help expand Avengers Campus into the multiverse at a later date. See, wasn't kidding. A lot of new stuff is happening at Disneyland in 2023, and that means you need to know how to do those seemingly impossible things to help maximize your trip where you can. How about visit Disneyland with fewer crowds? When the 100 Years of Wonder celebration kicks off and Toontown reopens, we are expecting some big crowds in Disneyland. We're also expecting lots of people to flood the parks around those traditionally always busy seasons, like around spring break and summer vacation and the end of year holidays. But even during times when Disneyland crowd levels aren't at their predicted peak level times, you can still run into some pretty long wait times and bottlenecked pathways, especially in the evenings and on weekends, because Disneyland is such a locals park. So here are some tactics we've used in the past to get ahead of the crowds and get on rides faster. First, attend a Disneyland After Dark event. These are festive evenings that take place after Disneyland closes for some exclusive themed entertainment, rare character meet and greets, shorter attraction lines, and most importantly, fewer crowds. Currently, you can get Disneyland After Dark tickets for the new Princess Night that we talked about earlier, and the Valentine's Day themed Sweethearts Night, which takes place on select nights starting January 31st and through February 16th, 2020. Tickets start at $129 per guest. 
The event lasts for four hours after the park closes for the rest of the public. However, you can enter Disneyland three hours before the event kicks off to get even more use out of that ticket price. We're still waiting to hear if the other two Disneyland After Dark events, Star Wars Night and Villains Night, will still be happening in 2023, but we'll let you know just as soon as we get new info about either one. Go ahead and join our newsletter. The link is in the description below and it's totally free and that's where we put the information first. Along the same lines, you could go to Oogie Boogie Bash. This is the Disney California Adventure After Hours party that takes place during the Halloween season. During this one, you'll be able to dress in costume if you want to. It's still rather toasty in California around September, October and explore interactive trick-or-treat trails, rare Disney character sightings, the not-too-spooky decorations, including effects that transform Carthay Circle's bow tower into something Oogie Boogie would be more fond of. You'll also find some Bash-exclusive snacks available for purchase and Bash-exclusive entertainment, like Mickey's Trick and Treat Show, the Frightfully Fun Parade, and the Villain's Grove Maze, which is filled with villainous scenes presented through lights, shadows, and sounds along the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail. It is very cool. And much like Disney Disneyland After Dark, Oogie Boogie Bash is capped off at a limited number of guests each night, giving you way more breathing room and shorter wait times for the rides. But I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Getting tickets for Oogie Boogie Bash is almost on par with getting Taylor Swift concert tickets. Almost. But it's not impossible to get them. When you know tickets are going to go live on the Disneyland website, make sure to set aside some time to get online and secure your Oogie Boogie Bash spot fast. In 2022, Oogie Boogie Bash tickets went on sale starting June 30th and were completely sold out for all 24 nights by July 4th. So if you want to experience this Halloween event in 2023, start looking into when these tickets are going to go on sale starting around May or June. Another good tip to avoid those crowds is using early theme park entry. If you're staying at one of the Disneyland Resort hotels like Paradise Pier, Grand Californian, or the Disneyland Hotel, you can get into the Disneyland Park or Disney California Adventure Park 30 minutes earlier than anyone else. That way, you can immediately get in line for some of the more popular rides without worrying about the excess crowds and hour-long wait times. And even if you're staying at a non-Disney-owned hotel, it's still super beneficial to get to the parks at Rope Drop, aka when they first open. Disneyland stays pretty quiet for the most part in the mornings, and that's because this is more of a locals park, like I said. So you're going to experience lots heavier crowd levels after folks get off work or on the weekends. If you're willing to wake up early on the weekdays of your visit, you can still get a lot done before the parks get a chance to fill up. Now, how about the impossible of getting the best views for nighttime spectaculars? World of Color, Fantasmic, Sleeping Beauty Castle's fireworks. When you're at the parks and you want to prioritize one of these major evening shows, try these tips on for size. Always choose the second showing. This doesn't happen all the time, but during busier times of year, the nighttime spectacles will offer more than one showtime. If this is the case during your visit, go ahead and choose the second showing to attend. Many guests will default to the first show so they can wrap up their park evenings earlier and start getting the kids ready for bed. And that means you may find it easier to get a better view and have fewer crowds to fight against during the second run through rather than the first. And on that note, also keep in mind that the Disneyland nighttime shows don't happen every single night like they do in Magic Kingdom. On weekdays during slower seasons, like mid-January and February, for instance, the Sleeping Beauty Castle fireworks won't be happening. Instead, you'll strictly have a projection show, and once the holidays wrap up at the beginning of January, Fantasmic goes into hibernation mode until the spring. So before you make those ticket purchases, check Disneyland's hours and events calendar on their website to see what days the shows will be offered during your visit. And let's talk about those virtual queues. If you want to guarantee a good view for DCA's World of Color, you can try to join the show's virtual queue. This will reserve your spot in the Paradise Gardens Park, which has a crystal clear vantage point of Paradise Bay where the show takes place. To access the virtual queue, you need to already be inside Disney California Adventure Park, or you need to be in Disneyland Park with a park hopper ticket. The virtual queue opens up on the Disneyland app, aka the equivalent of Disney World's My Disney Experience app, at noon daily. But these virtual queue spots do fill up quickly. Don't wait till a few minutes after 12 o'clock and then try your luck with the virtual queue system. Make sure your app is open and ready to go at 12 p.m. on the dot. If you don't get into World of Color's virtual queue, that does not mean you won't be able to see the show just means you won't be able to stay in the sectioned off Paradise Gardens Park area to see it. 
The Disneyland website recommends that if you don't get into the virtual queue, you should still make your way over to the Paradise Bay area 30 to 45 minutes before the show begins and ask a nearby cast member about walk-up viewing options. And honestly, don't sleep on this tip for any of the nighttime shows. The last time Bria went to Disneyland, she asked nearby cast members for quick suggestions for Fantasmic and the castle show views, and they were able to point her toward a section that worked better than she could have tracked down herself. Cast members are so knowledgeable and so helpful. Just remember, they're also going to be pretty busy close to showtime. So if they're doing something important like directing traffic, practice patience and wait for a good opportunity to talk to them. Now, you can also purchase a dining package. This will guarantee what you're looking for. Both Fantasmic and World of Color have dining packages and they'll give you three course meals and prime show viewing locations. For Fantasmic, you can dine at either Blue Bayou for lunch or dinner or Riverbell Terrace for dinner only. After your meal, you'll receive a voucher that'll admit you to a separate reserved viewing location for the show that evening. And for World of Color, you can go to the dinner buffet at Storytellers Cafe or the full service lunch or dinner at Wine Country Trattoria. But here's something to also keep in mind on this one. As the new 100 Years of Wonder show starts up, there's a very good possibility that new dining packages will also be instated. So keep checking back on the Disneyland website and the DFB website too, just in case new dining package options become available in the future. Again, we'll have that in our newsletter, so go ahead and sign up now. And this is not gonna be for everybody, but maybe it's for you. You could really splurge on dining. You have 15 grand burning a hole in your back pocket? Then you can really guarantee a good view for Fantasmic with a meal at 21 Royal. This is an ultra expensive, super exclusive dining experience that makes Victoria and Albert's at the Grand Floridian look like a bargain. This is where you and 11 of your closest friends can dine at a multi-course feast above the Pirates of the Caribbean dark ride. Not only is this six course meal full of interesting and rare dishes, but each course is also accompanied by a sommelier crafted wine pairing. Oh, did we mention the cocktail hour? Plus, each diner receives park hopper tickets and you'll get the perfect view of Fantasmic from the 21 Royal Balcony. But uh, definitely cheaper ways to see the show than this. That's why I listed this one last. If you want to learn more about this wildly expensive dinner experience, we've got a DFB video going into all the juicy details on our YouTube channel right now, giving you a sneak peek at this place without you having to drop all that dough yourself. The next impossible feat we're gonna help you do is skipping those lines without paying extra. Let's say you're not a big fan of waiting at super duper long lines. I get it. And you don't wanna pay a whole lot of extra money on an after hours event for less crowds. And you don't wanna pay for lightning lanes either. Something we'll talk about more in a bit. Is there a way to skip the major lines for free? Okay, let's talk about options. First, you can use single rider. Rides that offer a single rider lane can usually save you a lot of time, but it's not always a guarantee. That's because you're only given a seat on the ride when there's an opening for one person. So it's really a toss of the coin whether the single rider line is gonna be way faster or the same. That being said, more often than not, we've been able to use this third lane option and cut down on our wait times by a good chunk. Single rider lines could be available at rides like Matterhorn Bobsleds and Millennium Falcon Smugglers Run in Disneyland and Grizzly River Run, Web Slingers, Radiator Springs Racers, and Credit Coaster and Goofy Sky School in DCA. Also note you will be split up from your party on the ride if you choose the single rider line. Next option, see if those buddy passes are available. Two rides in California Adventure, which include Toy Story Midway Mania and Monsters Inc. Mike and Sully to the rescue, have a different kind of single rider line that's not so single after all. The buddy pass allows groups of one, two, or even three, if it's two adults and one child, to enter through the buddy pass line if they plan on only using up to one ride vehicle row. Buddy passes aren't always available at these rides, but it's worth checking in with the cast member at the front of the experience to see if they'll be available on the day of your visit. That way you can potentially cut down on waits for these two attractions too. And don't forget about rider switch. If someone in your group isn't tall enough to ride a certain experience and needs someone to stay back with them, you can use the rider switch option to make sure no one in your group who really wants to ride a ride is forced to miss out. Rider switch lets one of the adults of the group wait back with non-riders while the rest of the group rides the attraction. After they get off, the adult who had to stay behind can now take their turn without having to wait in an entire queue all over again. Just check with the cast member at the front of the attraction before you get in line to get Rider Switch all set up and ready to use. Ready for us to expose some money and time-saving tactics for Disneyland Resort? Then I'm not going to tease you anymore. Let's get right to it. Look into booking a good neighbor hotel. 
Although Disneyland may look pretty limited with their three resort options, Disneyland has over 50 good neighbor hotels that they partner with around the resort to help you save money on your nightly stays. Many of these hotels are actually within walking distance of the Disneyland parks, which is going to be extremely useful for your time there. Unlike Disney World, Disneyland is very condensed. Once you enter the Downtown Disney Shopping District, you can walk to the end of the strip and enter the Disneyland Park on your left or Disney California Adventure on your right. The close vicinity makes traveling between places very convenient, and it means there's more opportunities for you to walk to where you need to go instead of having to worry about any lines for public transportation. So if you can find a good neighbor hotel within walking distance to the property, not only can you potentially find a nightly stay for under 200 bucks, but you'll still be so close to literally everything the Disneyland parks have to offer. Not to mention, some good neighbor hotels still offer free breakfast along with your stay. Not all of them, but some of them, meaning you can get a guaranteed daily meal included with your room purchase. Currently, there aren't any good neighbor hotels that offer the early theme park entry benefit like the Disney-owned hotels do, but I'll let you know if the status of that ever changes. Now, if you decide to stay in one of Disneyland's owned resorts, not only will you receive that early theme park entry benefit 30 minutes ahead of everybody else, but you can also use the resort's merchandise pickup services. Merchandise Merchandise pickup and delivery lets you send your purchases from the parks back to your hotel as soon as you buy them, preventing you from having to carry a souvenir bag around the parks all day long. You buy a souvenir, you ask it to have delivered back to your hotel and you collect it later on back at the resort. Now if only Disney World would follow suit and bring this perk back. And if you don't have enough hours in the day to get all the souvenir shopping you wanted to get done, done, the shops on both Main Street USA and Disneyland and Buena Vista Street and Disney California Adventure stay open up to an hour after the parks close. World of Disney and Downtown Disney also stays open later, but you can always check to see just how late each store will remain open by checking your Disneyland app for updated hours. You can also take a secret passage into the parks. If you're staying at Disney's Grand Californian Hotel or Disney's Paradise Pier, you can enter Disney California Adventure without going through the main gate like everybody else. For Paradise Pier Hotel, you can find the park entrance located next to the security parking booth at the entrance of Disney's Grand Californian Hotel. Guests using this entrance will enter the park between Seaside Souvenirs and Corndog Castle in Pixar Pier. The entrance is surrounded by big red walls, so it's pretty hard to miss. For Grand Californian guests, the secret entrance into DCA is located next to the Napa Rose Restaurant and exits you straight into the Grizzly Peak area, only steps away from Grizzly River Run. You also want to learn about the parade before it returns. Since the Magic Happens Parade is returning in February, you're going to need to know about the best viewing areas to see these floats in action. The Magic Happens Parade route runs through Fantasyland and onto Main Street USA. Along this route, there are four prime designated viewing areas. The first is in the Small World Promenade. The second is in Fantasyland near the Alice in Wonderland Dark Ride. The third in Central Plaza and the fourth is in Town Square. If you plan to prioritize this one, make sure to show up to any of these four locations about 20-ish minutes before the show begins. Much like the nighttime spectaculars and the fireworks, the parade may not happen daily, so check the entertainment schedule or your Disneyland app for dates and show times during your visit. You'll also want to know the catch when it comes to shows. Sometimes the Disneyland nighttime spectaculars take turns, and sometimes just the fireworks are happening, sometimes just Fantasmic is happening, and then there are the times neither are happening, and you'll have to settle for the nighttime castle projection show only. Now, per the release of this video, I can only see the entertainment schedule throughout January and the first week of February, and Fantasmic is keeping pretty quiet during both those months. But here's what I'll say about trying to catch both Fantasmic and the new Wondrous Journeys show in one night. The busier the season, the more likely both shows will be playing during your visit. Kind of like a catch-22 there, right? Again, Disneyland's shows aren't as consistent as Disney World, so keeping up with the event calendar on the website is going to be the best way for you to figure out when exactly you're going to have the best chance to catch both shows during your visit. Now here's another gray area for you to consider. Of course, we're gonna start talking about Genie Plus next. Are Lightning Lanes gonna be worth that extra cost for you and your group, or will you be able to survive without them? There are not as many Lightning Lanes in Disneyland as there are in Disney World, so is it worth the same cost? Let's go back a few paces here. Disney Genie is a free planning service built into the Disneyland app that can help you create a personalized itinerary. With Genie, you'll be able to see forecasted wait times, mobile order your food, chat with virtual assistants, see walk-up waitlist availability, make restaurant reservations, adjust your plans. Basically, you're going to get a whole lot of help at no extra cost. But there are two premium services for this planning tool as well called Genie Plus and individual lightning lanes. 
Disney Genie Plus is a paid fast pass like service. The prices start at $25 per day per person in Disneyland, but have the ability to surge to a higher price range on the daily during busier seasons. Unlike Disney World's version of Genie Plus, you won't be able to make your first Lightning Lane selection until after you get into the parks. In Disney World, you can make your first selection starting at 7 a.m. before the parks open if you're staying in their hotels. Highly popular attractions like Radiator Springs Racers at Disney California Adventure and Star Wars Rise of the Resistance in Disneyland will not be listed on Genie Plus. Instead, if you want to use the Lightning Lane for those rides, you'll have to pay for the attractions individually. Okay, that's a good summary for now, even though there's still a lot more to these services that you'll want to study up on. In short, you're paying to skip the lines of your favorite rides. And now we've got to determine if it's really necessary to buy this in Disneyland or not. So Lightning Lanes could be necessary if you plan on traveling during a busier time of the year. Disneyland may not get as crowded as Disney World, usually, but it can still rack up those 60 plus minute lines that you're so not going to want to wait in. Not to mention, along with your Genie Plus purchase, you'll also get to download all your PhotoPass pictures you took in the parks that day, which can be a much better deal than Disney World's Memory Maker package that ranges between $169 and $199. But Lightning Lanes may also not be necessary if you don't think there are enough Lightning Lanes available in each park for the $25 plus add-on to be worth your cash. To give you a better visual, here's a complete list of the lightning lanes available between both parks, along with the average wait times you'll usually experience in the main queues for these rides during the year, not factoring in down or peak seasons. Several rides have queue lines that you could probably wait in without needing some extra assistance from that lightning lane, and some of those bigger rides that have bigger waits can usually still be hit up earlier in the morning for much shorter wait times. But here's the kicker. Notice that not every Disneyland ride is available on Genie Plus. You cannot get lightning lanes for Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan's Flight, Astro Orbiter, Casey Jr.'s Circus Train, Davy Crockett's Explorer Canoes, Dumbo the Flying Elephant, Jungle Cruise, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, and lots more really popular rides. There are 16 rides you can't get lightning lanes for in Disneyland. And Disney California Adventure also has a handful of rides that don't offer lightning lanes, including super popular ones like Luigi's Rollick and Roadsters and the Little Mermaid Ariel's Undersea Adventure. So if you don't think paying that $25 plus is going to actually get you your money's worth out of said investment, you may be better off skipping the Genie Plus route and relying on just getting up and around in the mornings to hit up as many rides as you can in a single stretch. As far as individual lightning lanes are concerned, for Rise of the Resistance in Disneyland and Radiator Springs Racers and Disney California Adventure, the feeling is mutual. Sure, the price could be worth it, but we're talking about potentially paying around 20 bucks per person for one ride on either of these experiences. Honestly, Rise of the Resistance's crowds tend to dwindle down toward the end of the day when guests are getting ready to settle in for dinner or find a spot for the nighttime spectaculars. So you may not have to worry about waiting a super long time to get on this one, but on busy days, I will eat those words. And Radiator Springs Racers has that single rider line that could potentially cut down your weight if the line's looking a bit too threatening all day long. So it really just depends on when you're visiting and if you really, really, really want to avoid possibly intense waits. What I will say is, if I had to pick an individual lightning lane to purchase, I'd choose Radiator Springs Racers over Rise. The queue for Radiator Springs Racers is partially covered, but still completely outside, while Rise of the Resistance's queue is like 95% indoors. So if you're at the parks during one of those really, really, really hot California days, waiting in the Rise of the Resistance's air-conditioned cave is preferable to long stretches of hot, winding sidewalk leading up to Radiator Springs Racers. I was just there in a really hot time of the year in 2022, I waited in the Radiator Springs Racers line and it was brutal. Ooh, now it's time to talk about one of my favorite parts of Disneyland. Epcot's not the only park that gets to have all the seasonal festival fun. Disney California Adventure also hosts different festivals throughout the year too, which includes the Lunar New Year celebration, the Food and Wine Festival, and the Festival of Holidays. Much like Epcot, DCA uses these celebrations to showcase a bunch of different cuisine, while also giving you the chance to meet rare characters, perform exclusive shows, create a few seasonal crafts, and just enjoy the seasonal atmosphere. But unlike Epcot, these festivals happen for a much shorter duration of time, and don't even happen at 
all during the summer. These are the time frames that you can expect to see the three different fests pop up in DCA. Lunar New Year runs from January 20th to February 15th, 2023. Food and Wine Festival is from March 3rd to April 25th. And the Festival of Holidays 2023 season has yet to be announced, but usually starts up in the second week of November and lasts until the beginning of January. If you want to make sure you're getting the absolute most out of any of these festivals, don't forget about these three secrets. First, consider buying a Sip and Saver Pass. When the Sip and Saver Pass is available to purchase, this nifty souvenir credential features eight pull-off tabs for a set price that you can trade for one food item or non-alcoholic beverage at the festival marketplaces. This can be a useful tasting around the fest tool if you're wanting to try multiple items during your visit. All eligible foods and beverages will be listed on the Sip and Saver Pass, so you don't have to waste any time tracking down the places that'll take your tabs by yourself. For this past festival, Festival of Holidays, the passes cost a set price of $59.99 each and could be purchased at festival merchandise carts as well as shops like Seaside Souvenirs, Kingswell Camera Shop, and Russian River Outfitters. You can also see if you can attend early. There may be a way for you to check out a festival before the fest's actual starting date. Sometimes Disney California Adventure Festivals have what's called soft openings a day or two before the kickoff date, meaning you can get a head start on all the fun. A soft opening is never guaranteed, and it probably means not every booth will be up and ready to go by then, but it's still a nice surprise when it does happen. That way you can report on your findings to your friends and family before the fest's offerings officially become mainstream. Next, know what festival offerings are happening outside the main hub too. Though the festival marketplaces can be found near and around the Paradise Gardens Park area, keep your eyes open for festival events happening in other places around the park too. For example, Soarin' Around the World transforms back to the original Soarin' Over California version for the Food and Wine Festival. Wine, beer, sommelier, and mixology education and tasting seminars also take place during Food and Wine at both the Sonoma Terrace at Golden Wine Vinery, as well as the Paradise Gardens area. And during Festival of Holidays, you can meet Santa on the Redwood Creek Challenge Trail. Raya from Raya and the Last Dragon also makes an appearance on this trail during the Lunar New Year Festival. And if you want to make sure you're not missing out on a single festival offering, don't forget to check out the DFB website. We've got frequently updated posts and printables centered around all things concerning the Disney California Adventure Festivals. We'll link those down below. And this is a big, big, big secret that a lot of people don't know about and it's going to save you a ton of time. Are you ready? Okay, order items from all the booths at just one booth. Okay, stay with me here. You can buy whatever festival foods you want without having to physically pay at every single festival booth. And no, I'm not talking about the sip and saver passes again. Find the marketplace booth with the shortest line and pay for whatever foods you're gonna want there and any other marketplace offerings you're gonna want too. You won't be able to pick up all the different marketplace booth foods at a single location, but what you will get is a receipt of purchase. Take that receipt up to the booths that you already paid for in advance to skip the payment process and get your items faster without worrying about standing in line to order and pay all over again. I wish Epcot would take notes on this. It's such a huge time saver. All right, speaking of food and snacks and festival booths, Disneyland has some really top-notch food and drink options on property. And I honestly prefer Disneyland's food over Disney World's food a lot of the time. So let's take a look at some of the best places to drink and dine around the parks. If you're looking for a fancy date night, Blue Bayou in Disneyland is a good option. This is in New Orleans Square. And if we had to compare Blue Bayou to a Disney World restaurant, it's got similar vibes, at least in atmosphere, to San and Helen and Epcot. The restaurant sits next to the first swampy scene of the Pirates of the Caribbean dark ride, so you can watch guests float by on during your meal. And in the dining room itself, you'll be in a dimly lit room with a gentle glow of paper lanterns hanging overhead. It's kind of like you're outside in the bayou. But as much as the low lighting sets the mood, it does get pretty dark in here. So dark that your menu comes with installed lights so you can actually see what you're ordering. So now that we can actually see our menu, let's point out some of the best offerings. The battered and fried Monte Cristo sandwich made with turkey ham, Swiss, and powdered sugar on top has been a classic favorite for decades here. Other heavy hitters include the chicken jambalaya and the chicken gumbo, but for the record, if you're not a big fan of Cajun or Creole eats, there aren't a lot of options on here for you since the menu is pretty limited as is. And another FYI, if all you want is the Monte Cristo, go get it at Cafe Orleans because it's cheaper. Another good date night spot, Carthay Circle and Disney California Adventure. In a park that's all about celebrating California culture, the fine dining restaurant Carthay Circle fits like a glove. 
love. This takes guests back to the golden age of Hollywood, a lot like Hollywood Brown Derby does in Hollywood Studios, but like in actual California this time. The Carthay Circle restaurant is based on the theater where Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs first premiered back in 1938, so major historical significance here. There aren't a ton of different entrees to choose from on this menu, but the options that are available are individually priced and inspired by Southern California flavors, like the braised Barrera style beef pot roast, the thick cut Caribbean pork chop with Jamaican curry, and the grilled Angus beef ribeye. The appetizers here are fairly unique from other signature locations. You can order starters like the cheese stuffed arepas, the roasted chicken parmesan soup, and the warm cheddar rolls. Lots of comfort food here. That's fancy enough for a date night. All in all, Carthay Circle has lots more style going on than substance. It's beautiful to look at, it's a great date night destination, and it's got a lot of historic influence, making it worthy of being on this list. And let's talk Napa Rose and Disney's Grand Californian Hotel and Spa. This is a sophisticated and authentic dining experience in the award-winning Napa Rose restaurant settled inside Disney's Grand Californian. The menu's got fresh seasonal flavors with a focus on wine country cuisine, and it's by chef Andrew Sutton, who is basically the head honcho of food in Disneyland. Napa Rose also has one of Disneyland's finest wine collections for all you connoisseurs out there. Napa Rose offers fine dining for dinner each evening, and from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. on Thursdays through Mondays, they host a character dining experience, Disney Princess Breakfast Adventures. This presents a three-course breakfast that includes cold starters, a buffet of hot entrees and desserts, along with interactions and photo ops with Disney princesses, themed activities, and special take-home keepsakes for the kids. Oh, and one more thing, Napa Rose also has the chef's counter, which offers two seatings per night and has a clear view of the restaurant's open kitchen. If you dine at the chef's counter, you can certainly order from the regular menu. However, for a fixed price, the chef will design a custom multi-course menu just for you. Now, if you're looking for a casual sit-down meal, of course I'm gonna say again, Cafe Orleans in Disneyland. Let's say you can't get a reservation for Blue Bayou, and you want a slightly cheaper and just as tasty spread of New Orleans-inspired food, and let's also say that you'd rather dine somewhere where you're not squinting to see the person across from you, then Cafe Orleans may be a better alternative. This is also located in New Orleans Square, which, you know, makes sense. You got very vintage vibes going on here, brass light fixtures, stained glass panels, dark wood details, literally zero Disney characters, Characters, which doesn't make it unappealing by any means unless you want all things Disney in your face at all times during your trip. This place is classy and it feels like a captured moment in time, and maybe it is. This was, after all, a place that Walt Disney himself frequented often back when the park's earlier years. But back then it was called Creole Cafe instead of Cafe Orleans. And this is honestly probably my favorite restaurant in Disneyland. The menu serves similar offerings like you'd find at Blue Bayou, Chicken Gumbo, famous Disneyland Monte Cristo, and of course there's incredible palm frites with that remoulade, so good. And there are a few different options as well, steak frites, shrimp pasta, ratatouille, farro risotto. But something that you need to know about this location is that most of the seating is outdoors. There are some indoor tables, but when it comes to atmosphere, what you're really looking for is that great table outside on a beautiful Southern California day where you get to watch the boats and the canoes traverse the rivers of America. Now, Lamplight Lounge in Disney California Adventure. There's a lot to love about Lamplight and Pixar Pier. The theming is incredibly inspired by the Pixar animation process. And there's something new and interesting to look at on every space of the dining room walls. There are sections dedicated to Wall-E and Ratatouille and Toy Story. Even your drink coasters will feature rough sketches of your favorite characters. The drinks here are a lot of fun too, with options like the bourbon and tropical tasting Sunrise Spectacular, the gin and hibiscus teaser, and the vodka, passion fruit, and ginger beer concoction over budget. Mm, called out much. But much like the Carthay Circle, Lamplight Lounge definitely has its hits and misses. What I will recommend here is getting the lobster knock Nachos loaded with warm lobster, black beans, aged cheddar Oaxaca cheese sauce. They're hefty, easy to share, and they're probably going to give you the best bang for your buck. Note, there are two parts of Lamplight Lounge. Guests seated downstairs will have additional menu options featuring full entrees, while guests upstairs may order drinks and shareable appetizer plates in the lounge area. Also note, this place is super hard to get into, so this is when you'll want to prioritize advanced dining reservations for, which open up 60 days before your trip begins. It also may be possible to get on the Lamplight Lounge waitlist, though this doesn't guarantee your table here. You'll have to physically go to the restaurant and ask a host up front if a waitlist is available. Even if it isn't available the first time you check, it's always worth checking back on again later and seeing if the status changes. In the past, we've been able to get on Lamplight Lounge's walk-up waitlist first thing in the morning or at off dining times like around 3 or 4 p.m. And let's not forget one of the coolest parts about Lamplight Lounge, 
the super secret hidden room, AKA the office. In order to get into the office, you have to find a secret vault, which you'll be led to via cast member assistance. Then you've got to unlock the vault, which means you've got to spin the wheel to illuminate all three lights. And once you're inside the office, you'll be in a space that can seat up to 13 guests. This is a great space to hold special events like, I don't know, my 40th birthday. But who knows, you may be lucky enough to get seated there without booking it ahead of time if it's not already being used by someone else. This secret room is decked out with tons of caricatures of Pixar animators. And if you're feeling like you could really go for a game of backgammon during your time in DCA, there are a few classic game boards hanging on the wall too, which you can pull down and play while you're waiting for your meal and drinks. And Wine Country Trattoria in Disney California Adventure. This is a table service restaurant with a charming Tuscan architecture. You got hand painted murals, lots of vines and greenery, a lush patio you can choose to dine on, which we always recommend unless the heat is too much. And of course, a restaurant with wine in its name is going to serve up the good stuff. So brace yourself for an extensive wine menu with wine flights too, so you can try a few at once. Though the wine menu has a lot of options, the regular menu is a little bit smaller. You'll find things like spaghetti bolognese, Tuscan salad with shrimp, rustic bruschetta that you can share with the table. There's nothing that's gonna scream, oh my gosh, I have to go back here ASAP, but it's an okay location for a relaxing meal in an otherwise pretty upbeat park. Now, of course, this is Disneyland, so you may be looking for some character dining. Plaza Inn, located on Main Street, USA, is one of our favorite places to see a bunch of characters while you're eating. This has been around since 1955. There are plenty of pictures of Walt himself sitting inside this restaurant. But much like Cafe Orleans, Plaza Inn used to go by another name instead, the Red Wagon Inn, which is why the little red wagon corn dog cart is right outside. The atmosphere here is Victorian with both indoor and outdoor seating. Now, I'm not gonna talk about lunch and dinner at the Plaza Inn yet, cause that's not when you're gonna find the characters here. Plaza Inn is a very different experience in the morning. One of the key reasons for that being the Minnie and Friends breakfast at the park. During this time, you're gonna be able to see a whole gaggle of different characters. You know how in Disney World, they have like characters that make sense to be together, like Lilo and Stitch or, the Hundred Acre Wood characters all together. Well, that's not what happens at Disneyland. It is just a hodgepodge of anyone who shows up. You got like Chip and Dale, Daisy, Pooh and Tigger, Pluto, Captain Hook, and then Minnie Mouse. <laughs> you never know who's gonna show up. And breakfast is all you care to enjoy with options that are fairly predictable. You got things like biscuits and gravy, made to order omelets, and those classic Mickey waffles. And if you wanna cut down on those meet and greet wait times at Disneyland, you might wanna come to Plaza Inn so you can have more time for rides and shows and knock out a bunch of character interactions all in one. And there's Goofy's Kitchen too at Disneyland Hotel. This is tucked into a corner of Disneyland Hotel. It's one of the most high energy dining experiences on property. Though characters may vary, Pluto, Chip and Dale, and Minnie are often spotted along with your canine host with the most, Goofy. True to Goofy's natural chaotic energy, guests will be encouraged to participate in a pot banging culinary celebration while you dine on a variety of buffet specialties served at five all you care to enjoy stations. Goofy's Kitchen is open for breakfast and features items like Mickey Mouse pancakes and Goofy's famous peanut butter pizza. And during dinner, make sure to scoop up a large helping of Goofy Roni and cheese or check out the fresh carving station for flavorful meats. And Storytellers Cafe at Disney's Grand Californian Resort and Spa lets you celebrate the art of storytelling inside a warm restaurant that welcomes guests with larger than life murals, wood carved artisan style detailing, and a wood burning fireplace. Oh, and characters, tons of characters. Mickey's Tales of Adventure Breakfast and Brunch is a morning meet and greet that features table side visits from Mickey and his pals during your buffet meal. And they're super cute. They're all dressed in their hiking clothes. Characters are subject to change, but usually include Mickey, Minnie, Pluto, Chip, and Dale too, all dressed up for their next epic adventure. Breakfast is served Mondays through Thursdays, while brunch is offered Fridays through Sundays and on select holidays too. Though Disney characters are not around during dinner, guests will still be able to enjoy a buffet that focuses on California cuisine, which may be preferable if you're trying to have a nice date night at your resort. But maybe you don't have time to sit down and eat. You need food on the go. So let's go to Plaza Inn at Disneyland. Wait, Weren't we just here? Yeah, but now I'm back to talk about lunch and dinner. After breakfast wraps up at the Plaza Inn, the restaurant goes from a prefix all you care to eat spread to a cafeteria-like counter service. Meaning you'll pick up a tray, tell the cast members behind the buffet what you'd like, they'll hand it over, and then you pay for it up at the front. Easy. Lunch and dinner serve up pretty straightforward options that are good for groups that are looking for a lot of food and a lot of familiar food. The best thing to eat here is the Plaza Inn fried chicken. It is absolutely 
incredible, lots of sides, mashed potatoes, oh my goodness, it's delicious. They also have pot roast and a couple of other things like pasta, but get the fried chicken. Over at Jolly Holiday Bakery in Disneyland, you've got that Mary Poppins themed situation, which is right across the street from Plaza Inn. This has outdoor seating only, but you're gonna have such a nice view of Sleeping Beauty Castle, plus some umbrella shade to keep you semi-cool. And if you're eating here while the Disneyland Parade is performing, atmospheric bonus points. You can hit up this little bakery during breakfast, lunch, or dinner. There's good stuff on the menu all the time, but one of our favorite Favorites is that toasted cheese and tomato basil soup option with an amazing grilled cheese, tomato basil soup, it's so good. But let's not forget about desserts because you just skip straight ahead to the desserts at Jolly Holiday and we don't blame you. They've got knockout sweet treat options like the raspberry rose macaron with fresh strawberries and raspberry rose almond filling. Heads up on that one, everybody loves it but I think it tastes like flowers. So if you're one of those people that's not in love with like floral flavors, then this might not be for you. They also have a flaky and chocolate filled croissant pastry, the chocolate mousse brownie with touches of crunchy chocolate pearls for a little added texture and style. And there's also lots of seasonal treats here. They pop up in their bakery display cases depending on the month or the holiday, etc. So don't be surprised if you see a cookies and cream Mickey Mummy macaron staring at you from behind the glass. Now we're going back to New Orleans Square for the next quick fast food option that we love, French Market at Disneyland. Once again, you're in the presence of a more Cajun cuisine, but yet again, a cheaper price range than both Blue Bayou and Cafe Orleans. This price range is around $11.99 to $16.99 here at French Market. But there aren't any Monte Cristos here. You can get a Louisiana style buttered shrimp po' boy, which is hearty, but not so much that it's gonna make you miserable. They've got slow roasted beef French dip. And one of my favorites is their corn chowder, which comes in a bread bowl. And over at the window right next to French Market, you're going to find the mint julep bar. Remember, you have to go inside the restaurant to order or pick up your French Market food, but you won't be able to order a mint julep in the same indoor locations. The French Market and mint julep bar are separate locations that are just really, really, really close to each other. So the line leading up to the mint julep bar could be mistaken for the French Market one if you're not careful. Same thing goes for the mint julep bar's other specialty offering, beignets. That's right. You can also order Mickey-shaped beignets at the mint julep bar in either three to six counts. And there are going to be seasonal beignets sometimes during the year. So definitely check out our newsletter to find out when those are happening. The seating is all outdoors here underneath a covered patio. And if you time your visit just right, you'll get to listen to some live jazz while you dine, which happens periodically throughout the day. Rancho Del Zocalo Restaurante at Disneyland Park. This is fresh and flavorful food, generous portions, and a beautiful setting with outdoor seating. And you can order authentic Mexican dishes like burritos, enchiladas, nachos, and street tacos. Though the seating at Rancho Del Zocalo is an open air market type environment, it's also covered, so you don't have to worry about eating heavy burritos directly under the California sun. Heading over to Disney California Adventure, we're gonna go to Pim's Kitchen in Avengers Campus for our next fast food spot you gotta try. This is the only food that shrinks and grows. Thanks to the latest PIM technology, the same tech that our Marvel heroes, Ant-Man and the Wasp, use, the food on this menu isn't your average sized meal. The not-so-little chicken sandwich has a teeny looking brioche bun in comparison to the giant fried chicken breast jutting out from the edges in a comically large proportion. And the PB3 Superb Sandwich is made with PB&J, banana, and candied bacon on blue streak slices of bread, or as the PIM technologies menu refers to it, PIM particle bread. I'm sure it's super safe to try. What's the worst that could happen? The sandwich also comes with a micro banana smoothie as if the meal itself wasn't already sweet enough as is. But the big, and I mean huge, item on this list is the family-sized pimini, a major sandwich with salami, salame rosa, with pistachio nuts, rosemary ham, provolone, and sun-dried tomato spread on toasted focaccia. They're not kidding when they say this thing is family-sized. You're not going to want to attempt this one on your own, and if you order it, you're not going to be paying the quick service price for it. This pimini will cost you a whopping $99.99, so come hungry. If you save room for dessert, and believe me you should, then go ahead and grab the Celestial-sized Choco Smash Candy Bar, which is made with dark chocolate, peanuts, caramel, nougat, peanut butter, and chocolate brownie. The sheer size of this candy bar makes its $8 price tag a huge, great value. And attached to Pim's Test Kitchen is Pim Tasting Lab, which is the quick service's dedicated bar area where you can get your craft beers and themed Pim Particle-infused cocktail experiments. We like ordering up some of those special beers on tap that fill from the bottom of the cup. Up because the future is now. Since this bar area is separate from Pim's Test Kitchen, you'll have to order from the Tasting Lab separately on mobile order. 
But you can still order some munchy items off the Tasting Lab menu too, like the snack molecules, which are a mix of mini pretzels, honey roasted peanuts, and sweet and spicy popped sorghum. Sauntering out of Avengers Campus over to Pacific Wharf, let's talk about the Pacific Wharf Cafe. This is one of my favorite places to swing by when I'm in the park because it's just carbs and more carbs. This little cafe is best known for its sourdough bowls and for good reason. They bake them fresh right there in the attached Boudin Bakery, which is modeled after the original one located in San Francisco. You can get your bowl filled with clam chowder, a seasonal soup like the current Cajun pan roast, or mac and cheese. Along with the bread bowls, you can also get Mickey-shaped loaves of sourdough here. And if you want to see how they're made, just talk into the bakery and watch the magic happen. You may even get to try a free bread sample while you're at it. And if you thought the free bread was enough to sell you on this place, just wait till you get your hands on the seasonal bread pudding. The bread pudding options offered at Pacific Wharf have a rotating lineup of flavors. Sometimes you'll go and get to treat yourself to the cherry cheesecake bread pudding, and sometimes you'll find an option like the lemon and wild blueberry bread pudding. The fate of Pacific Wharf Cafe is a little rocky right now. During the 2022 D23 convention, it was announced that the entire Pacific Wharf area would soon be transformed into a reimagined San Francisco based on the Disney animated film Big Hero 6. But currently, Pacific Wharf still remains, and so does its delicious fresh baked bread. Now let's talk a minute about seasonal snacks. Disneyland always has so many specialty treats for Halloween and Christmas that pop up in several locations around Disneyland property. Last year, we saw things like the Vampire Alien Macaron, filled with blackberry buttercream and lemon curd at Alien Pizza Planet in Disneyland Park. The new Halloween cake made with purple colored vanilla sponge, raspberry mousse, fresh raspberries and candied cocoa nibs over at the French Market restaurant, and the blood orange slush with a swirl of raspberry sauce at Galactic Grill in Disneyland Park. And for Christmas, we got to celebrate the season with items like Bananas Foster Funnel Cake Fries topped with cinnamon banana sugar, caramel sauce, whipped topping, and fried bananas at Award Wieners in DCA, Mexican Chocolate Cheesecake made with spiced chocolate cheesecake finished with white chocolate mousse and chocolate decoration at Boardwalk Pizza and Pasta at DCA, and the sourdough bread over at Pacific Wharf shaped like a snowman, a candy cane, and a Christmas tree. There's also a Vampire Mickey for Halloween. This is only a small selection of the many, many, many seasonal snacks Disneyland releases during these festive times of year. And you know that we eat every single one of them and review it on the blog. So make sure you sign up for our DFE newsletter if you want to be updated on all the newest seasonal Disneyland and Disney World snack releases that happen not just during the holidays, but all throughout the year, because we have got you covered. So we've exposed Disneyland's secrets, we've got you set up with DCA festival tips, and we've even given you that full list of the best Disneyland restaurants for you to head up during your visit. But now it's time to talk about DFB's pro advice that the team wants you to know about, since these are the things that have been the biggest game changers for all of us at one point or another during our West Coast trips. First, rent a locker. Don't want to be a pack mule for all your hoodies, sunscreen, extra snacks, and that one plush that your kid just had to bring along but now refuses to carry? Rent a locker. There are four different locker locations in Disneyland. You've got the lockers on Main Street USA in the Disneyland Park, the ones on Buena Vista Street in DCA, the ones in the Esplanade located outside the main entrance to both Disneyland Park and Disney California Adventure. Lockers range in price between $7 and $15 per day and can be purchased at guest services for either park. Or if you want to rent them yourself, there should be a little kiosk off to the side of the lockers where you can perform a self-checkout, whatever you prefer. Second pro tip, walk through Sleeping Beauty Castle. Aurora doesn't just want you to ooh and ah and take pictures in front of her castle, she wants you to go inside and relive her story. Throughout the passageways inside Sleeping Beauty Castle, you'll be able to admire 3D dioramas that tell the story of Princess Aurora, from the three good fairies to Maleficent's spinning wheel prick and all the way up to happily ever after. Post giant dragon battle, of course. Next, you want to make time for other shows. There are so many different indoor and outdoor performances you need to check out during your visit because A, you won't have to wait in a forever long line to see them, and B, if you see an indoor show, you'll get to experience that glorious AC action and get off your aching feet for a while. Here's a complete list of the indoor-outdoor shows you can catch while you're in the parks. In Disneyland, you can see the Dapper Dans, the Disneyland story presenting great moments with Mr. Lincoln, storytelling at the Royal Theater where popular Disney tales are recreated with a humorous twist, rotating stage shows at the Fantasyland Theater and Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. And in DCA, you've got the amazing Spider-Man, aka the first ever animatronic to literally sling himself from a rooftop and somersault in mid-air, the Disney Junior Dance Party, Doctor Strange, Mysteries of the Mystic Arts, Five and Dime, Mariachi Divas, 
Mickey's Fill Her Magic, and the TikTok famous Turtle Talk with Crush. You also want to know which attractions close early. In order for World of Color to take place, some of those rides and attractions around Pixar Pier have to close up shop early each day. These include the Carnival Games at Pixar Pier, Incredicoaster, Jesse's Critter Carousel, Pixar Pal Around, Inside Out Emotional Whirlwind, Silly Symphony Swings, Jumpin' Jellyfish, and the Golden Zephyr. The only ride in the Pixar Pier area that doesn't close during showtime is Toy Story Mania. And the only ride that doesn't close in Paradise Garden Park is Goofy Sky School. Fun fact, this is usually when you're going to see these rides wait times at their shortest. And you can visit the Disney Animation Building. This is a hidden gem and nobody knows about it. The Disney Animation Building holds several different indoor experiences in one convenient location. You got the Animation Academy where you can learn to draw a Disney animated character, Turtle Talk with Crush where you can have a live conversation with one cool sea turtle, the Sorcerer's Workshop where you can make your own little animations and enter into the Beast's Library to take a quiz that'll help you find out your Disney personality. If you stay in this room long enough, lightning will strike and the scene will change. Just wait it out. And you can meet Anna and Elsa here too. But one of the best parts about this building is the center of it all, the animation courtyard. You can just sit back, relax, and watch a 360 degree multimedia presentation about the animation process while several popular Disney films play out overhead. It's definitely a must-see place. And don't forget to meet the little man of Disneyland. You know those fairy doors that people sometimes add to the base of their trees to add a little bit of fairy tale whimsy? You can find a similar portal in Disneyland Park. But no typical pixie-like creature lives behind this door. This is where the little man of Disneyland leprechaun lives. You'll find this wee lad's house hidden in Adventureland near the Indiana Jones Adventure attraction. You look closely at the roots of one of the trees and you should be able to find his little door, window, and porch light. Now, this is something that's always confusing to new guests in Disneyland. How do you get into Batu? There are multiple entrances. So when you're trying to get over to Galaxy's Edge, you'll have three different entryways to choose from. One is at the edge of Critter Country. One is out of Frontierland, which will take you under a bridge. And the last is on the border of Fantasyland when you hit a fork in the pathway. Instead of heading onto Frontierland, you can go up into Galaxy's Edge instead. Your straightest shot to getting to Galaxy's Edge is gonna be taking that second option that cuts through Frontierland, since the path from Critter Country is kinda out of the way and forces you to navigate around Rivers of America first. Okay, ready for the basics. All right, we've told you a bunch of secrets and a bunch of tips, and now it's time for the basics. So if you're going to Disneyland for the first time or if you haven't been there in a while, this is the section for you. These are important basics you're gonna need to know if you book that big vacation. Ticket pricing is based off a six-tier system. Disneyland's ticket prices vary depending on when you visit. If you visit during times when there are fewer crowds and less demand, you might find ticket prices to be a bit lower, meaning they're part of the tier one ticket range. But if you're visiting Disneyland during peak times, like at the start of the 100 Years of Wonder anniversary or when Toontown is reopening or when it's getting closer and closer to Christmas Day, ticket prices are going to be at their highest, meaning they'll be in the Tier 6 ticket range. And then there's the middle of the road tiers two to five, which you'll come across when park demand is average, which will typically happen during the weekdays, maybe in the spring summer seasons when there aren't any huge events or attraction openings going on, but you'll still find a pretty steady stream of guests. Currently, ticket prices start in the Tier 1 range at about $104 per day and spike up to $179 per day in the Tier 6 range. Now keep in mind, Disneyland still uses their Park Pass reservation system, so once you purchase a ticket, you'll need to reserve your spot in whichever park you're wanting to visit. You can check and make sure there's still Park Pass availability before you buy your tickets on the Disneyland Park Pass calendar online. So let's say you purchase a ticket for a Tier 4 day price. This means you can make reservations on a day that's priced as Tier 4, 3, 2, or 1. But if you buy a ticket for a Tier 1 day, you can only make reservations that fall into that same tier because there are no lower tiers past 1. It's tricky, I know, and why don't they use the same system Disney World uses? Wouldn't that just make sense? But purchasing tickets in general is a pretty straightforward ordeal. Just make sure you have a My Disney Experience account set up beforehand, then you can either go to the Parks and Tickets tab on the Disneyland website and check on the Theme Park Tickets option, or you can go to the Disneyland app, tap on the hamburger shaped menu button on the right, and select the top left Tickets and Passes button. The app will lead you through the rest of the process from there. Next basic tip, park hoppers have rules. If you want the ability to jump between Disneyland and Disney California Adventure, you're gonna need to purchase a park hopper app add-on for your tickets. Park Hopper add-ons start at an extra $65 per ticket but have a fluctuating price range based on demand. There are a couple notable differences between how you navigate Park Hoppers in Disneyland 
versus Disney World though. For starters, if you wanna hop to another park, all you gotta do is walk from gate to gate, which is really nice since you won't need to worry about a whole lot of extra travel time. Park hopping also starts earlier in Disneyland. Your park hopping in Disney World is 2 p.m. and you can hop to your next Disneyland park starting at 1 p.m. You will have to start your park day in the park you made a reservation for, which is definitely on par with Disney World's rules too. Now, where to find the characters? So where can you meet some of your favorite Disney pals? Oftentimes around Disneyland, you may be able to catch a free roaming character especially in areas like Galaxy's Edge and Avengers Campus. But there are also designated meet and greet locations too, which you can find on the Disneyland app, like the Royal Hall in Disneyland, where you can meet a rotating cast of princesses. Character sightings and meet and greets will often pop up on the Disneyland app and change day to day, so make sure to keep checking back on the app to see which characters are going to be out and about during your visit. You might be able to see Captain Jack Sparrow in red near New Orleans Square, Winnie the Pooh in Critter Country, and possibly even Mary Poppins taking a ride on the carousel. And since we mentioned the whole Magic Key controversy earlier, let's talk about what the Magic Key annual passes actually involve and why they're so popular for so many people. In August 2021, Disneyland Resort introduced a new program to replace the previous annual pass holder program. This new one's called Magic Key. The Magic Key program offers key holders reservation-based admission to the two Disneyland Resort theme parks. But what key you buy will determine your level of theme park access and benefits. There are four different key levels. Inspire is the most expensive of the bunch at $15.99. Yep, that's $1,599. But will give you the most park pass reservations at a time and the least amount of blockout dates. Magic Keys can be worth it if you're frequent flyer to the Disneyland parks. They also offer up quite a few perks per tier, like included parking, merch, dining, and Genie Plus discounts, and included photo pass. But only one person in your party really needs a Magic Key in order to reap the benefits. As long as the person with the Magic Key is paying under their account, the entire group will still be able to receive discounts. You'll just have to remember to directly pay the key holder before or after your trip. If you're interested in a Magic Key for the future, since we're assuming eventually they may go on sale again, you can purchase them once they go live online at either Disneyland.com or on the Disneyland app. All right, we did it. We covered both Disneyland and Disney California Adventure. Don't forget, we have a whole 2023 Ultimate Guide playlist that'll cover every single Disney park in the U.S. So check our YouTube channel for even more Ultimate Guides. Okay, now is the time to head over to DisneyFoodBlog.com slash Disneyland 2023 to get your printable copy of everything we talked about here today. Thanks for listening, everyone, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.